Hello everyone, this is Sam Biagetti of Historian Splaining, and I said earlier that I would be trying to produce material each week now, and I promised that as the result of a poll that I put on Twitter, I would next comment on the history of policing, but since <laughs> today I happen to be in proximity, safe proximity to my friend Oliver Rhodes Murphy, who is also a historian with a PhD in American history. I figured I would talk with him about his research, which happens to be topical, as often happens with your research. You sort of get lucky, <laughs> and your topic ends up in the news again. But Ollie, you want to say hello? Hi, yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so we're here outdoors near the beach actually. Uh, and Oliver's research is on U.S. policy regarding Bolivia, mm -hmm. which, as I said, is again in the air in discussion because of current events. But you particularly researched the U.S. response to the Bolivian Revolution of 1952. So firstly, why did you focus in on that, of all the incidents mm -hmm. that the U.S. has dealt with and responded to for decades. Why did you zero in on the Bolivian Revolution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, most people, when they introduce their dissertation topics, get the response of, oh, wow, that's really specific. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, why did you, you know, why, why on earth would anybody choose to do that? Well, your um, advisor always tells you to narrow in on something real specific. Right, right? <laughs> you know, but yeah, you sort of have to do that yeah. in part because you have to sort of say something new. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, so I came at this really, you know, I was always generally interested in American foreign policy. Uh, and I came from this, yeah, sort of, you know, sort of leftist, you know, critical perspective. First really got interested in Vietnam and then sort of mm -hmm. trying to understand American foreign policy in the Cold War sort of through that, you know, through that entry point. And then I took a class uh, as an undergraduate that looked at U.S. Latin American relations, yeah, during that period, during the Cold War. And a lot of the, you know, sort of, I sort of developed a, a picture of, you know, okay, this seems to be how this is working. There are left-wing revolutions that are happening, you know, oftentimes not necessarily really anything to do with what's going on in Russia or the Soviet Union, but were always interpreted as this kind of Cold War threat, uh, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, these proxies of Moscow, you know, puppet regimes that were sort of springing up in places like Cuba and Guatemala or, or Chile that mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. then had to come in and sort of squash and or they felt they had to come in and squash. And it was this sort of reflexive sort of anything that was vaguely left wing was immediately associated. And, you know, this is the time of McCarthyism mm -hmm. and this sort of Cold War obsession with communism. And so, you know, that was my basic understanding. And Latin America has plenty of these examples of, yeah. of left wing revolutions that got brutally and uh, cynically sort of taken down by U.S. policy with this sort of Cold War justification in mind. So mm -hmm. I sort of felt like I had a good picture of, of what U.S. policy was and what it was doing in Latin America. And then with this sort of example of Bolivia came up and it sort of almost came up in passing. I was like, well, it didn't seem to really happen there. And I always sort of thought, oh, that's really interesting. I sort of, I don't really understand. I, I read an article that sort of explained it, but I was not very satisfied with the explanation. So, you know, I want to, I want to look at that more. And yeah, so, and while I was sort of deciding basically what I was going to do, I ended up going to uh, graduate school to do a master's and I focused on that that question uh, and even at the end of that year I was still like yeah I, I need to you know I need to look more I still haven't really satisfied my curiosity there's a lot of stuff in Bolivia that I need to look at and so uh, I you know went into the PhD with that in mind to really understand so why is it in Bolivia this place where it seems like very radical very left-wing thing this is a revolution a violent mm -hmm. revolution uh, with these sort of like Trotskyist and like you know very hard left peasants and uh, miners are, you know, taken to the streets and, uh, and you know, sort of defeating the Bolivian national army and mm -hmm. then installing themselves in the center of political power. Why is it that the U.S. is trying to align itself with that political movement, even as it's seeking to nationalize companies that have a lot of interests and a lot of, you know, a lot of sway potentially in, in Washington? Yeah. So, like, U.S. companies, yeah, being being nationalized you know it seems like this immediate red, red flag and yet the bolivians uh managed not only to sort of avoid 
a U.S. sort of backlash, but they get a lot of your support. Right, and they and the U.S. actually extends aid to this new revolutionary government in Bolivia, mm -hmm. which makes a big difference for them and, and is, ends up being a lot of their revenue. Oh, yeah, yeah. By the mid-50s, it's something like a third of their um, budget is covered by the U.S. government. Uh, yeah, so this raises all sorts of questions about why did this turn out so differently in this one instance compared to so many other events that probably some of our listeners have heard of, uh, maybe others not, uh, the overthrow of a democratically elected government in Guatemala, later in Chile in the 1970s, a similar uh, coup got some U.S. support. Uh, you mentioned Vietnam. There are instances in Africa, like the overthrow of Patrice Lumumba. CIA may have been involved. I'm not an expert, but was They were complicit. pretty involved. Yeah. Okay, they were involved. <laughs> you would know more than I. Uh, but Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. Uh, so what happened differently. So before we get into that and what it means for how we understand U.S. policy and U.S. power, give us a little sketch of what was this Bolivian revolution? Where did, mm -hmm. Why did that happen? Where did that come from? Sure. Well, you know, so this is not the, the first instance of like a sort of non-democratic uh, transition between, between governments in Bolivian history. And in fact, I think up to that point, uh, since independence, there had been more governments in Bolivia than that Bolivia had a, had of years of existence. Uh, so very, you know, mm. sort of tumultuous political yeah. um, picture, uh, and also kind of combined with, uh, yeah, a lot of economic deprivation and inequality, and this sort of, you know, you can trace this, you know, right the way back to Spanish colonialism, the sort of notion that. Bolivia, despite being actually very materially very wealthy, and this, you know, uh, Potosí, which is the sort of center of the Spanish Empire, mm -hmm. sort of source for uh, all these precious metals that the that the Spanish extracted. Nevertheless, Bolivia and Bolivians, or people who lived in that land that then became Bolivia, remained very poor. Yeah. Um, so it's a very unequal society, <clears throat> right? And you have sort of classes more in the cities, right? If I'm not mistaken, that are more European. There's more wealth there. Mm -hmm. And then you have large rural areas that are more indigenous population, often very poor, mm -hmm. no land ownership. Mm -hmm. So this group forms in the 1940s. If I have this right, Movimiento Nacional Revolucionario. That's right. right. MNR. The, yeah, National Revolutionary Movement. Right. And they're a sort of intellectual group, but they favor nationalizing the tin mining. So that's this big industry in Bolivia, right, mm -hmm. that employs a lot of people. And the country is largely dependent, right, on mm -hmm. for the economy. It's dependent a lot on the tin mining. But the tin mines and the companies are mainly owned by foreign investors, mm -hmm. right? Not a lot of the wealth is staying in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And then meanwhile, in much of the rest of the country, you have poor campesinos, right? Mm -hmm. So this is sort of peasants, right? right? Indigenous peasants. So the MNR has a program where on the one hand, they want to nationalize the mines, mm -hmm. right? And they also want to redistribute land mm -hmm. right? and sort of bring land ownership, investment to the indigenous people and bring them into a kind of modern economy. Mm -hmm. So you emphasize in your dissertation that it can seem as if, well, this is, this is a left-wing revolutionary socialist group. Mm -hmm. But in fact, they weren't, they didn't really see themselves that way and weren't really perceived that way for a long time. Right. Mm. Well, it's complicated. They did and they yeah. didn't. But certainly there were there were a lot of doubters who, yeah, essentially saw, you know, the MNR is led by a bunch of, yeah, sort of light skinned intellectual types who are, yeah. Who, and who, some were very right leaning. Right. Yeah. So the MNR also had a bit of a struggle. And in the early years, there was a lot of sort of gravitation towards uh, towards fascism. And these sort of, um, yeah, like sort of more right wing, there was a sort of dalliance with, um, and I think, you know, a, a significant degree of, of sort of anti Semitism, mm -hmm. uh, actually, that um, a lot of Bolivians, or, you know, there's not really a huge Jewish presence in Bolivia, <laughs> but <laughs> there seemed to be an issue that, that resonated, thing, yeah. uh, you know. Um, and yeah, as, as I think, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot of Latin Americans were looking at how Latin Americans seem to have fallen behind and how mm -hmm. examples from Europe or, you know, the sort of uh, more, you know, sort of developed world might provide mm -hmm. models for them to mm -hmm. sort of 
borrow from yeah, yeah. to help you know further their own their own causes. Right. Uh, but I think that debate was largely over, you know, certainly by the 1950s. Right. You know, you know, right. <laughs> the Second World War was over and the fascists were, were out. And, uh, and more of the MNR start to call themselves socialists right. and adopt more of that kind of left wing. Right. And on the one hand, you could say, well, they're egalitarian. They want worker control, mm-hmm. and land redistribution. But they also really want development, right? They mm-hmm. want to see Bolivia sort of leap forward, m- modernize, mm-hmm. right? And they see the nationalization and even the land reform too mm-hmm. as sort of a way of bringing people into more of a modern growing economy yeah right? and actually like market relations like mm-hmm. so this isn't like big collective farms right. the idea is that the peasants who previously were working in these big sort of almost like feudal estates were now going to be given their own plots of land and become you know, property owners uh, mm-hmm. And that was mm-hmm. part of their transition into this sort of full citizenship. So they'd be right. like economic citizens and then also political rights would come along with that as well. Yeah. So they got yeah. the right to it's, vote. And I think one person even at one point says it's kind of Jeffersonian. Right? In many, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, yeah. you could, you could use that analogy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so quite conservative uh, in some. Well, depending in, on how you look at again, it. Again, depending <laughs> on how you look at it, right? But yeah. these, these are armed peasants who are, mm-hmm. who are mm-hmm. literally taking this land for themselves. And then, you know, sort mm-hmm. of in, in many cases, the government is sort of following along behind or then trying to sort of rationalize this process mm-hmm. and say, okay, well, it has this okay. legal legitimacy. Manage it, right. Yeah. So in 1952, you have a very disgruntled miners Right, mm-hmm. who've been fighting for, you know, they're unionized, they've been fighting for pay, for control of the workplace. Mm-hmm. And they've been getting a lot of pushback, and a lot of suppression from the army, a lot of violence. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so there's real clashes mm-hmm. going on, uh, in particularly in the cities, right? In La Paz? Well, right? in, in and in the mining areas, which is okay. also where the population centers sort of are, in this right. high altiplano um, yeah. in Bolivia. Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah, um, that's where all this stuff is kind of happening. Okay. So these sort of militant unions join together, make a partnership with the MNR, mm-hmm. and on this platform of seizing and nationalizing the mines, making mm-hmm. them a public property instead of owned by mainly foreign investors, right? Mm-hmm. And they successfully take control of the country, right? They defeat. The right. army, right? Yeah. They win. They win the clashes in yeah. the streets. They take control of the country and they set up this new government. Mm-hmm. And when they do this, at first Truman is still in office. That's right, right? And Truman, so correct me if I'm wrong. Truman takes this kind of cautiously supportive approach, mm-hmm. right? Uh, he accepts that this is the new government, and his administration buys up a a bunch of tin basically to keep their mm-hmm. economy going mm-hmm. right it's like a short term but but yeah it is it, it's right. a significant contribution that they need at the time the truman administration also kind of like demures for a while they take a long time to actually recognize uh okay. the yeah. government as like the actual government of bolivia mm-hmm. uh but i th- would say yeah by the last months of the truman administration there is like a sort of cautious you know acceptance but also with this still a kind of wait and see approach like they, we've staved off any right, sense right. of like an immediate collapse, but we haven't really come up with a long term right. strategy. Right. Yeah. So so Eisenhower comes in in the beginning of 1953. Right. And you have the new White House. Right. Mm-hmm. You have the State Department. You have the embassy in Bolivia and the CIA and all of these policy apparatuses now have to work out what are we going to do about Bolivia? What is going to be our relationship to this revolutionary government? So basically, what what do they do? (laughs) Well, um, yeah, sort of surprisingly to many, uh, you know, at the same time that all these institutions are gearing up to overthrow the democratically elected and, you know, to many people's minds, more moderate left-wing movement in Guatemala that is also advocating for land reform and nationalizing U.S.-owned, you know, sort of properties. You know, some begrudgingly, but but many actually enthusiastically decide that we are going to really double down on our support of the Bolivians and start pumping in tens and eventually hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in aid, um, as well as, you know, uh, continuing to buy these sort of tin tin contracts, which were essential to the, you know, now government-owned mines that they need these revenues to be able to even come close to balancing the books. Mm-hmm. 
So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty rapid over the course of a few months. Really, in the summer of 1953, they decide to you know aggressively embrace the mm. Bolivian Revolution. Yeah. So, so this. You said it was surprising to some people at the time. It also can be surprising to a lot of people learning about this today. Why does it seem like this one event or this one country produced such a different response? So we're definitely going to get into that. But say we back up for a moment and say, well, this goes to a bigger, broader question of what was the U.S. policy and what were they, what was their mentality, their ideology, what were their aims in how they approached all of these developing countries around the world in this era, right? From Mm -hmm. the 50s onward, from the 50s to the 70s, we could say, roughly, right? Mm -hmm. The sort of high Cold War. Mm -hmm. Well, there are several different ways of of approaching that, of answering that question of what were these people up to? Why were they interfering in the ways that they did with various countries? And one is basically, like we've already said, It was the Cold War. They were afraid of the expansion of communism, of Soviet influence, and that's what basically determined their actions, right? But why why does that explanation fail? Well, because I would say, you know, if that was the case, then Bolivia would just immediately fit into this sort of category and wave all these red flags. Um, And my my dissertation spends a lot of time sort of demonstrating that mm-hmm. um, that really they had more than enough evidence to you know to get rid of these guys or to at least to try and get rid of them based on this sort of anti-communist cold war dogmatism yeah. or that kind of reading of the situation but um, that's not to say that any of this stuff was like unimportant they obviously did pay attention to it and they did want to try and push the Bolivians like to this more sort of like anti-communist direction Mm -hmm. and the Bolivians did make some um you know symbolic concessions on that on that ground but I also sort of think that actually a lot of those concessions the U.S. policymakers recognized were largely symbolic and really you know failing to mask how the position of Marxist ideology and organized far-left political parties were actually gathering in strength and influence in Bolivia during the 1950s and yet you know I have one uh, official who just sort of remembers uh, well we just sort of gave them a pass you know we we let it pass it wasn't worth pressing that point yeah we had other fish to fry so you know there's something else going on here well and I think there's a big factor here which I was sort of saving but we can address it first now and maybe we'll go back to it more later is that a lot of the explanation here has to go down to the MNR leaders themselves Mm -hmm. and the fact that they sized up the situation and very shrewdly managed the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, it it can be easy, regardless of what your political affinity is, it can be easy to fall into this notion that, well, the U.S. was just this giant power and just ran roughshod over everyone and everything and not see the agency on the other side too. Different countries and different governments and different leaders could take different tacks and manage the U.S., not just vice versa. And a lot of these leaders, the president, the foreign secretary of the MNR, emphasized like, oh, we're we're not communists, we're not Soviet aligned, and they finessed people and Uh, persuaded them, persuaded American officials to come over more to their side. And there's this wonderful quotation, I think my favorite part, where a State Department official is recounting a meeting with, or a conversation with the president of Bolivia, the new revolutionary president. And he says, well, you know, those guys running the new state in Bolivia, they're Marxists at worst, but not international communists. Right. <laughs> which can sound really bizarre from, you know, if you're used to American rhetoric, to think that they would actually make that distinction. Right. But maybe it's like when you're just coming out of a meeting with someone who's very persuasive and pr- convinces you that the, there are these fine differences and they matter, that that can kind of redirect you to say, all right, well, maybe it's okay they're, they're Marxist. We mm-hmm. can tolerate that. But they're not international communists. So what, what do you see 
as that distinction? Does that, mm-hmm. does that mean something to you? I, very much so, I would say, yeah. Uh, and I think the idea is that, yeah, you know, you can read the works of Marx and actually, you know, even the U.S. policymakers themselves and modernization theory, this sort mm. of idea that we're engaged in the struggle with the Soviets basically for the future of humanity and what human society mm-hmm. is going to look like and how do how are, you know, sort of developing countries going to develop? What's What's the best way to do that and what's the future going to look like is it going to be a sort of communist utopia or is it going to be sort of free market capitalist democracies yeah yeah Um, and you mentioned development theory which is very very important right to the u.s and latin america mm -hmm. this idea that the u.s can can help latin american countries to to develop and prosper and modernize but make sure that it doesn't go too much in the communist direction, that it goes right. more in, in our or in a direction acceptable to the U.S. Mm-hmm. And so it, maybe you could say this Bolivia policy kind of presages what would later happen with, like, the Alliance for Progress and, uh, you know, the mm-hmm. Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Mm-hmm. We're going to invest in Latin America and try to bring them in t- to our level, you could right. say, right? Right. So there's a sort of condescension to it, too, of right? Very much bringing so. them yeah. to our level. Yeah. yeah. So, well, let's save that for a minute. But, um, oh, but the distinction between Marxism uh, and international, and international communism. Right. So, yeah, yeah, you combine to some of these ideas about how economic development might happen or how societies sort of evolve. And that's like an intellectual tool to understand the problems that your society is facing. And, you know, I think actually the, the Americans and the Bolivians agreed that Bolivia was mired in this backward sort of semi-feudal mm. social model that was hampering its economy, that was destroying its politics, that was, you know, leaving the vast majority of its people impoverished and exploited, yeah, in this sort of state of backwardness, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which, I don't know, that's a whole other discussion. But, you know, yeah. clearly they, they, they saw similar problems, right. uh, even though some of them were using Marx to identify those problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but that was sort of okay as long as that didn't translate into a political project that aligned them with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. we can be intellectually Marxist, but still want to give land to the peasants and have this sort of, in many ways, like sort of market capitalist kind of revolution Mm -hmm. um, to further the goals of our society. And we can do that with the help of the United States. Um, Mm -hmm. And so if we align ourselves with the U.S. and actually looking to the U.S. as a kind of partner, um, we can not only seem like sort of tolerable, but actually quite attractive. Mm -hmm. And like maybe the U.S. can sort of play the good guy and say, hey, we're helping out this like impoverished backward country as we see it to progress. And instead of being the bogeyman that's always coming in and like squashing and, you know, sort of repressing everybody. You know, yeah. we can be the good guys. Uh, and Why don't so, they like us? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you know, see, we're helping out all the time. Like, yeah. come on. We want, yeah. to, we want to help. They just don't let us help. They you just know? don't let us. Yeah. So I think that's really the key is that the Bolivians saw that desire on the U.S. side and were able to appeal to it and manipulate it mm-hmm. uh, and successfully, whilst at the same time, you know, even doing quite radical things. And a lot of things that people in the U.S. were like, you know, mm, this is like... This we, is a little beyond the We pale. do not really prove, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, at least they're doing it with our cooperation and maybe we can sort of guide them in the right direction as we're doing it. And they're rejecting Moscow, yeah. you know, which, uh, you know, then this sort of raises another question of, well, other people tried to do that. You know, other people, mm-hmm. you know, other movements said we have nothing to do with Moscow. And yet they got overthrown precisely, precisely because the U.S. said, oh, well, you're just a tool of, of Moscow. But I think there's actually something a little bit more subtle going on there. And it, again, it has to do with their relationship to the United States. So the Guatemalans mm-hmm. also said, you know, this is a very moderate, democratic, you know, mm-hmm. we, we're not trying to create communism. We're also trying to give land to the peasants and, and mm-hmm. you know, sort of do things that are actually fairly moderate, or at least how they consider themselves. And we have nothing to do with Moscow. We, we, there's no contact. You know, even the, the Guatemalan Communist Party had no real mm. connection, no real contact, and, and Stalin certainly at the time had basically written Latin America off as like this is not, this is the U.S.'s backyard. We're we're not really trying to get involved here. That changed later, but um, right. you know, in the early fifties, that really wasn't happening. Pre pre Cuban Revolution, pre Cuban, that's well, not so much on the table. There. Yeah, you know, Khrushchev started to get a little, but even okay. the Cubans, like yeah, Khrushchev and 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 the KGB were a little hesitant 
uh, about can we really get on board can we really support yeah. these guys like first of all are they really communist enough like we know Raul is but um, yeah you know yeah do can we, can we make this work basically and it, yeah and in a lot of ways Castro sort of drove that process by alienating the U.S. and giving them an opening so that sort of that's a, a, a central sort of insight that I yeah that I want to raise is that people could and Castro also said that he wasn't a communist for a long time until yeah. he, he then in 1961 yeah. came out and said I'm I, a Marxist Leninist and yeah. I always have been you know? and I always have been <laughs> yeah, <right? You> know? <laughs> we have so, always been at war with Eurasia <laughs> go figure you know yeah but yeah. in 58 he was denying it to the to the rooftops yeah. um yeah. But it has to do with the attitude towards the U.S. So Arbenz and Castro, although adamantly non-communist in their sort of earlier stages, um, were also, to a, to, to a large extent, you know, anti-U.S. or perceived in the U.S. as sort of hostile to U.S. interests. Yeah. And that became the I think the the, the motivating factor or or, or or why they became put into this you know sort of communist you know sort of Cold War enemy camp was actually right. their anti-Americanism not mm-hmm. their pro-Soviet stance and the Soviets mm. became you know the you know the, the fallback position because of that prior falling out with the U.S. so the Bolivians managed mm-hmm. to avoid that and therefore still did pretty radical things but did it with U.S. patronage. So that's what really mattered. It was yeah, the relationships yeah. with the U.S., not ideological transgressions. Right. Well, and and there's a context here where there had already been decades of U.S. involvement and interference in various Latin American and Caribbean countries. And there was a lot of popular feeling mm-hmm. that the U.S. was... Uh, an intrusive power interfering in our countries, a lot of anti-American sentiment, you know, with plenty of historical <laughs> good, justification good reason, behind yes. it. <laughs> but that put these revolutionary governments in a very difficult, right. tight position of how do we placate the U.S. and keep them on our side without appearing to our supporters that we're selling out and giving in to yeah. American domination, yeah. right? And the MNR sort of had to negotiate that and manage to make it work right. for a long time. How, we, how can we be nationalist and budding up to the U.S. at the same time? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's peculiar. I mean, the thing is, if you were in one of these Latin American nations, that could seem like a contradiction. Right. And yet it seems, from Washington's point of view, it was not. Right. From Washington's point of view oh, of course you want to be nationalist. You want to build up your nation. You want to develop, and we'll, we'll do it with you. Yeah. So there's a distinction here that we can get down to. If we're talking about different explanations, why did the U.S. take the approaches it did? Just it's the Cold War doesn't work for various reasons, mm-hmm. like we've said. Also the fact that there was already heavy U.S. involvement. The U.S. already considered Latin America strategically important going back all the way to 1910 and the mexican revolution it was not something that just appeared in the cold war Mm -hmm. but then there's another explanation that some people put forward which is well it's just about economic domination it's sort of neo-colonialism and there's plenty of evidence you know to support Mm -hmm. that too people might point to guatemala and say united fruit company had Mm -hmm. these gigantic plantations and interests in guatemala when the Arbenz government seizes that, that maybe arguably triggers this mm-hmm. uh, coup. So, but that doesn't really work either, right? That doesn't work as a blanket explanation no, either. No, I, 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 I don't think so. Um, and certainly, like, you know, economic uh, considerations are, you know, not to say that they're not important and they can be a useful tool. One of the ways in which the U.S. did, I think, try and exercise leverage over the Bolivians uh, was actually holding this sort of threat of non-renewal of the uh, tin contract over mm-hmm. them. And so the Bolivians really always wanted this long-term contract. Uh, and the Eisenhower administration, even though it was pumping in all this money, was still like, oh, we'll give you like a year or, you know, this, you know they weren't really... Non-committal. Non-committal to mm-hmm. this long-term stable uh, relationship economically, which I think uh, was purposeful. Uh, and, yeah. And, and, and yeah, you know. Well, what's really interesting about the Bolivia incident, too, is that... The, the revolutionary government did nationalize those mines, oh, yeah. which had considerable monetary value, and there were American investors 
lobbying hard mm-hmm. at the Eisenhower White House saying you can't we can't accept this this is this is beyond the pale this is our property we can't allow some leftist revolutionaries to seize it from us you know a lot like what happened in Guatemala and in Cuba too sure, yeah. uh, and also tin is a pretty important strategic resource and mm-hmm. the US had needed it in World War II and yet when these nationalizations happened in Bolivia Ultimately, the Eisenhower administration concluded, well, if you pay some reparations, if you Mm -hmm. pay some compensation money to these owners, we'll consider that good enough. And it was not even a huge amount. No, it was kind of and they never paid the whole amount anyway. <laughs> they never paid you the know, whole amount anyway. It was, you know, yeah, and these companies were always complaining. But, you know, it, it, the point for the, for the Americans, I think, was the principle. And actually, mm-hmm. I would push yeah. back a little bit on the idea that, you know, there's, you know, the, the tin mines were, were very valuable. This was sort okay. of, this was at a, a point where uh, the tin industry was in a little bit of a crisis. Mm. Um, basically, the quality and the accessibility of the tin ore that they could get, you know, after these centuries of mining, mm-hmm. um, was diminishing. Was really diminishing, and other sources were opening up in Southeast Asia that okay. were basically making Bolivian tin very uncompetitive. Yeah, you know, tin. So, and actually, uh, the U.S. had a strategic uh, stockpile built up after you know World okay. War II. So, the immediate need for tin was also not so not great. Huge, so, right. those immediate kind of economic considerations were not so strong. But I think the general principle that if we let people just you know nationalize, take all these like you know things that private companies have invested a lot of money in and you know that that's gonna uh it's not so much the specific material interests of individual companies but it's the idea of the investment climate that future investments won't be very forthcoming if these companies are worried that you know some populist government is going to get elected and take away all their stuff yeah right so and it's and it's the principle at stake of who whose property rights are protected right, right. and on what terms right. and are our investments safe right in foreign countries, yeah. Right. So they did they, they did make a bit of a stink about that. But again, they sort mm-hmm. of let it, they also let it slide at the end of the day. Like, yeah. you know, they, they sort of, they, they, you know, stood up for the principle and that was good enough, even if the actual monetary value of what they, you know, ended up doing was not, was not really that significant. So, yeah, I don't know about the, um, you know, so, yeah, so you asked about the economic, economic motivations. Kind of economic determinism. Yeah, yeah. right, right. <laughs> well, you know, Bolivia certainly, at least if you think of this in, a, in terms of money, you know, Bolivia was very much a losing proposition. You know, they mm. were they were not going to be making money out of the, you know nobody, you know, private businesses in the U.S., the U.S. government, you know, U.S. interests in general were not going to be profiting from this kind of deep engagement in in Bolivia and trying to sort of remake Bolivian society in in the near or medium term. And U.S. Pol- policymakers wrote at great length about this. Uh, and in fact, Congress started to get sort of upset. They were, Why are we giving all this money to Bolivia? It's this radical government. They're still basically, we're throwing, we're, we're subsidizing this very left-wing, you know, mm-hmm. project that's, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, sort of running these socialized mines that are losing money hand over fist, but the government is doing that because it's politically, you know, sort of expedient and supporting the lifestyles of these miners. This is like a political a political trope. It's not to say that all these miners were living like, you know, high on the hog or anything uh, far from it. Um, but it was a redistribution of wealth and power. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And the U.S. subsidized it. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that, that was there was any sort of monetary or economic gain that mm-hmm. was really driving that decision mm-hmm. or even access to strategic materials. You know, I don't think tin... Right falls into that category there was a notion that there maybe were uh oil and gas reserves that that might be opened up um but that was that was very unproven and never really came to fruition in the 1950s in any kind of you know sort of successful way for for foreign investors or the u.s government certainly yeah well i think that so if we get to like the big reveal you know if we say all right clearly it's not we can't explain all these actions just by reference to Cold War anti-communism. And we can't just explain them by reference to simple monetary economic interests. And we can say, well, the MNR was able to appeal to something in the thinking and the self-image of these Americans to get the response they wanted. What is it? What were these Americans thinking? What were they up to? What was the point mm-hmm. of it all? And insofar as we can say there is some coherent point, there 
you use this term, which the State Department used repeatedly themselves, mm -hmm. of inter-American system. Mm -hmm. We want uh, a partnership, right? And I think your dissertation title is A Bond That Will Permanently Endure, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted to build a lasting relationship with a country like Bolivia. They like this idea, and it fit into this inter-American system. So what is what is the inter-American system? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. It wasn't always <laughs> uh, completely clear, you know, when when policymakers yeah. were using it, right? But yeah. I think it basically alludes to this idea that the Western Hemisphere is this sort of world apart, you know, obviously connected to the rest of the world, but nevertheless a sort of special sphere and a special sphere in which the U.S. has, you know, specific, you know, so I, that quote of the the bond that will sort of permanently endure is actually from Eisenhower. Uh, mm -hmm. when he's talking about, you know, so, so he sort of says, yeah, okay, we're involved, you know, the U.S. is a global superpower and we're engaged in, in all of these struggles and, you know, propping up governments and, or, you know, trying to bring down governments in various places from, from Laos to the Congo to, to you know, sort yeah. of Western Europe. But Latin America is special and it's a little mm -hmm. bit different. Mm -hmm. And we're doing all that stuff in large part because of this Cold War, you know, situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. But even if we weren't in a Cold War, we'd be there in Latin America and we'd be doing it anyway. You know, so this is sort of, we're sort of linked by history, we're linked by geography, we are linked by sort of common economic interests, geopolitical position. And so this is, you know, this, this is a relationship that we're really, uh, that the U.S. should tr be trying to kind of cultivate and create these sort of stronger links. And, you know, this, is, this sort of inter-American project, I mean, you could go all the way back to, you know, uh, Simon Bolivar and, and sort of the independence, sort of break away from European empire and the Monroe Doctrine right right yeah that the the these Latin American republics are off limits for mm -hmm. Europe right, right? They are, you know, they're now kind of in you could s kind of say they're in our sphere of influence right right well that was the ambition the reality was very mm -hmm. different and though the US wanted to exclude Europeans they didn't actually have a lot of power to be able to, to do, do that. that but that ambition was articulated from very early on right you yeah. know the 1820s and uh, and so yeah you know you could sort of you know trace a link from that sort of Monroe doctrine mentality you know through to the through to the 20th century but certainly seeing yeah Latin America as a special sphere of influence that they were trying to uh, protect and ultimately dominate or mm -hmm. or sort of be the sort of preeminent power and I think you know the senior of, partner the senior partner yeah. you know the hegemon if the hegemon you will. Yeah. yeah so yeah so you use this term in your introduction which is like it was already a pretty loaded term then. It maybe is mm -hmm. even more so now. And you hear it's kind of become a buzzword, hegemony, hegemony. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people use that word and they just assume that it basically just means domination or control, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's actually more nuanced than mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. So how would you describe what do you mean by the U.S. power in the Americas was hegemonic? Mm -hmm. Right. So, again, this is a word that, a lot of people interpret in a lot of different ways. Mm. Uh, and I guess the way that I'm trying to use it is sort of influenced by this sort of uh, Gramscian mm -hmm. sense. Antonio, of, which comes it, from Antonio Gramsci, right? right a Marxist this, uh, Italian scholar, uh, yeah. Italian Marxist scholar in the early 20th century. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And he sort of came up with this idea, uh, basically, sort of trying to explain the First World War. Why were all these like working class people? going off to fight and die in the trenches for these, you know, aristocratic, you know, monarchies and <laughs> yeah. empires and, and, and seemingly, you know, very willingly, you know, mm -hmm. with, with pride and, and with purpose. And so he came up with this sort of idea of, you know, why is it that, uh, you know, why, why, why do people act in the benefit uh, of the ruling classes? It's to do with this idea of hegemony. It's not just coercion. It's not just because they have, you know, the power, they have the police and the military, uh, or they, you know, they have all the money and they sort of, it's economic coercion. You know, those things obviously exist and are important, but there's more going on here. And so he comes up with a sort of ideolo ideological explanation that, you know, the sort of the ruling classes essentially set the norms of the culture of, you know, what is, you know, what is sort of um, acceptable behavior, uh, desirable. Uh, and the accepted know. assumptions, right? Right. Ideas How and does assumptions the world of work? life. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so by doing so, they get, you know, the way people believe and sort of interpret the world and their role within it, um, you know, and that, and that they willingly sort of believe in and then participate based on that belief ultimately serves this sort of ulterior motive or the interests of this sort of ruling class. 
So you could look at, you know, this idea, you know, like the American dream, for example. You know, if I just, mm-hmm. like, work really mm-hmm. hard, play by the rules, you know, I can make it big. Like, America is this, like, land of plenty and opportunity. And that might be true for some people. But for a lot of people, you know, they, their, their hard work goes towards, you know, making their bosses very rich, but mm-hmm. they do not become rich. Yeah. And, and it seems to me like a really core point also in this idea from Gramsci is that people aren't just brainwashed. Right. There's a set of assumptions that people can buy into and, and a language, a set of ideas that come with that, that less powerful people can also use to some degree and make claims and mm-hmm. contest. There can be contestation, negotiation. It's not just a top-down control right. yeah. project. Well, once the idea is out there, then it sort of takes on a life of its own, right? And you can you know, sometimes hold you know, sort of powerful people accountable based on the language and the ideas that they themselves are trying to mobilize, but then mm-hmm. you say, well, mm-hmm. why does that apply to me in this situation? Yeah, um, yeah. So you can think of, like, you might, a historian might look at uh, norms of, say, the middle-class nuclear family and say, mm-hmm. well, that was really the wealthy or it was the bourgeoisie who sort of imposed this idea. But then sometimes working-class people might say, well, I don't have enough space in my home. I don't have enough income to be able to take care of my family in this way that you're telling me, in the way that we all agree is proper, so you have to pay me better. You have to give me better housing or or land, right? And with this this issue of land reform, the U.S. in the 20th century was often very favorable to the idea of land reform in various countries, Mm -hmm. especially in Latin America, Because it seemed like, well, maybe this is the path for people to then live this sort of proper Jeffersonian lifestyle where you have your bit of property and you're self-supporting and independent. So so hegemony, it doesn't just mean there are people in control and they've got everyone marching in lockstep. It also means there's some sort of arena for for power, competition and contestation. Mm -hmm. Right. And so. When you, I think when you use this term talking about the U.S. and the Bolivian Revolution, you're sort of saying, well, there were certain boundaries. There were certain sort of mm-hmm. cases where people could push back against the U.S. and make demands beyond what the U.S. approved of. But if they were using the right terms, the right ideas, they mm-hmm. sort of fit it within this accepted ideology, they could, they could finesse it, right? right? They, could, they could get what they wanted. Whereas some people... If they just said, well, we reject the U.S. entirely, right. then they were seen as, okay, now you've just broken the rules. You're outside. You're right. outside the pale. You're a threat. You're a threat You're a to threat. the inter-American system, this sort mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. cohesive, uh, you know, friendly relationship between sister republics who are all sort of, you know, going along yeah, the same way. Know. They're all, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's this great, you know, hey, you know, uh, we're yeah. All buddies here. Happy family. Yeah. 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 Which is, it's easy to see it that way when you're the most powerful right. partner to think, right. oh, well, we're when all When you're the patriarch, this. yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're all doing great here. Everyone's happy, right. you know, except for that little troublemaker out there on the edge. But... So the MNR maybe kind of some of these leaders intuitively understood right. that this is the this is the rules of the game right now. Right. So this is how we're going to work with it and get what we need. So I think it's a really convincing way to use this this concept in this particular kind of sphere. But there's there's also more subtleties to it, right? When the U.S. says, "Okay, well we can embrace this government and we like what they're saying about development." There's sort of a notion, maybe unspoken, or maybe it is spoken, you, you might know, that these countries, ultimately their destiny is to become like us, right? right? They're sort of all, they're all going to become little Americas. That's absolutely, yeah. And there have been some, even Latin American revolutionaries, who themselves embraced that idea, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like in Mexico, we're now the United States of Mexico, right? Isn't mm-hmm. that, or is it Mexican United States is technically the... The technical official name for oh, the yeah. Republic, um, the Mexican United States. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I'm actually not sure, but uh, I think so. We'll yeah, look that up. Yeah. We'll look that up. <laughs> but, but this is, but it's kind of flattering to the United States, right? To think, well, we're we're going to extend right. aid, right? We're going to be supportive, and by doing so, we're moving them towards developing to be like us, right? Right, yeah. and and this has been extended in different parts of the world and all kinds of different arenas i think we mentioned earlier how there was this cultural diplomacy especially during Mm -hmm. the cold war right of using art and music 
to in this hope of sort of Americanizing everybody, mm-hmm. right? Or getting people to at least see the the U.S. Yeah, as, as well. First, firstly, to be more sympathetic to the U.S. Say, oh, they mm-hmm. have all this great stuff, and mm-hmm. you know, music and movies, and uh, you know, and yeah, like, and, and in particularly like trying to send like you know, sort of black jazz musicians out around the world and say, oh, hey, you know, we hear all these things about race in the U.S., but here's this sort of you know. Um, black people who are being like put up on a pedestal as like a sort of epitome of yeah, American see. art. See, we're great. No problems. Nothing. <laughs> we, you know. we, we love our black people. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great. Uh, yeah. Um, but there's sort of recent scholarship kind of digging up a lot of this, how there were great American artists like Jackson Pollock, where some of his art openings were sponsored by the CIA seems sort right. of random and disconnected. Yeah, like why why would the CIA care about this abstract you know, expressionism, yeah. right? But you could see abstract expressionism as uh, as representing sort of American individualism mm, and creativity, freedom, right. and, you know, unlike socialist realism mm-hmm. which is so constrained and propagandistic. So so again, although these things might seem so radically disconnected, you could see them as fitting into this mentality, right? That we are We are sort of a good power, we support democracy, we support individual freedom, and uh, and we can promote those ideals and hence encourage everyone to Mm -hmm. fulfill this destiny. To live the good life that we have sort of pioneered. You know, we are the future of humanity and everyone else is just sort of playing catch up a little bit. And if you are nice to us, we'll help you along. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, And it's interesting that Latin America is probably an area where that has worked the least right (laughs) because people are very primed to be distrustful already of the united states yeah because of this you know constant meddling and you know clearly self-interested behavior uh which is also happening um and yeah you know these sort of ideals that u.s policymakers and and sort of high officials might have uh yeah don't always work out uh, when the rubber meets the road and, and sort of politics, you know, really comes into play. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Bolivia is like maybe this sort of, is in some ways, weird exception where all these sort of forces align to, to make that vision sort of enactable or sort of possible, or at least, you know, they find, they, they find someone who's willing to work with them. Right. On right. those terms. And it's not necessarily because they buy into no. that American philosophy, but it's because they understand it. They can see that that's, yeah. what, they, that's what they need to appeal to. Right? Yeah. So people like wrote off the MNR as like total sellouts and, and, mm. and like moderates, or they, they, you know, the, the leadership basically destroyed the revolutionary potential of the revolution. Um, mm. You know, through this like sort of relationship with the United States. Right. And I don't think that's completely off base. You know, there were definitely su- sacrifices and compromises that were made. Um, but at the same time, I think that that under that undermines actually you know, really the radical achievements of the mm-hmm. Bolivian Revolution, yeah. which was, yeah. you know, the nationalization of these major components of, of the Bolivian economy and the, you know, putting at the center of political power these miners unions who now had effective sort of veto power over the mm. major industry of their country yeah. uh, and at the same time giving voting rights to indigenous peoples who were the vast majority of Bolivian citizens um, who previously couldn't vote who previously they, could not yeah. vote and redistributing land uh, at a pretty at a pretty rapid and successful pace uh, now there were many things that they failed to do and failed to live up to but you know revolutions don't always work out very smoothly towards this like ambitious vision of, yeah. of what you know their acolytes are like promising so you know, rarely given the context i think it, it in many ways it was really a remarkable and radical achievement yeah yeah and it really should be discussed more i mean when we talk about major revolutions people think of of course the french revolution mm. and of russia and cuba we don't uh mention bolivia you know because maybe because we just aren't aware of bolivia as important enough a country in our consciousness but it has been in the news, right, in the past year or so, because of the removal from power of the president Evo Morales. Mm-hmm. So, what is 
just just you know briefly, what's the significance of Evo Morales, or is mm. that too big to? That's too, well, I mean, I mean, the the big thing is like he's the first indigenous president. Mm-hmm. So the MNR were a lot about indigenous empowerment, or at least that was the rhetoric and the and the message. Mm-hmm. But all of the leadership were largely did not seem to come from this sort of indigenous uh, background. It's not entirely true. And uh, Victor Andrade, for example. Uh, but you know these okay. questions of like who qualifies as indigenous yeah, and who doesn't yeah. after hundreds of years you know of right yeah. yeah and in a, yeah in a country like bolivia which is you know heavily predominated by this indigenous you know mm-hmm. sort of presence mm-hmm. so but in any case uh, evo morales was you know the sort of unquestionably uh, the first indigenous president in sort of in his presentation and his you know sort of political persona okay uh, and and he is a socialist, right? And he's yes, pursued his party is the movement right? towards socialism, um, okay. and that's his sort of snail uh, space, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Very slow, very slow. Yes, very good. Um, but you know that I mean that's his framing and that's his political you know sort of rhetoric is you know we are this sort of left wing party. Although, mm-hmm. interestingly enough, like as and actually you know sort of eventually he did come to power largely off the back of these sort of protests against the privatization of, uh, well, first, uh, water in mm-hmm. some of these major Bolivian cities, mm-hmm. uh, and then following off of that, gas, like natural gas. Okay. Um, okay. And there was really, you know, a lot of a lot of violent sort of, uh, or a lot of protests and a lot of violent sort of reaction to those protests, and then I, eventually saw him come to power. Okay. Um, so that was his moment of arising in the national right, scene. Right, yeah. And just to be clear, there was a period of time, was it about 12, 13 years ago? There was a period of time when the government prohibited people from collecting rainwater mm-hmm. in their own yards or houses yeah. because they had made some contract that some private company had the right to mm-hmm. the water. Exclusively. <laughs> Exclusively. Yeah. The only person, you know, the only place you could get water was from this hedge fund managed, uh, you know, Aguas del Tunari. Wow. Uh, and yeah, it was pretty egregious and people rightly were outraged. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, you know, um, eventually, you know, chased this company out of town. But yeah, it was very bitterly contested. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot mm-hmm. of people who were, you know, sort of behind this project, uh, the sort of government officials who had signed this deal were very convinced that, you know, this is like, this is modernization. This is how we are mm-hmm. going to provide better services, make more money, become more economically sort of rational and profitable. And though it's painful in this moment, long term, it will, you Fault know, us ahead. It, yeah, yeah, right. You know, that definitely did not happen. Right. So there's been a shift in thinking, I think you could say in the US and in Latin America, there's sort of an elite shift in thinking from development theory that might be friendly to nationalization and redistribution mm-hmm. as part of modernization to then more of a neoliberal to mm-hmm. use sort of the right. n-word <laughs> of a neoliberal mentality that everything should be the private market right private deregulation privatization is good so morales uh becomes president and he was president for a very long time mm-hmm. right yeah was and he it, kept sort of you know sort of keep kept going and <laughs> trying to change the constitution and you know all this sort of so he could keep you know keep being in power mm-hmm. and there were um, term limits right right and those were that, overturned exactly yeah okay. uh and he was you know a sort of popular but also very divisive political figure interesting enough i would say that you know despite all this sort of railing against neoliberalism and and you know sort of uh proclaiming these uh you know sort of socialist credentials that the actual path of his sort of government was not, you know, or at least, you know, what a sort of person from the 1950s looking at this would say was socialist. Okay. You know, and actually a lot of, you know, and, and, and the government, a lot of the government's success was based on pretty robust economic performance during mm, the Morales yeah. years. But a lot of that was to do with like, you know, sort of private business. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, some people started to sort of question or some people on the left maybe sort of questioning these like sort of left-wing credentials. Uh, he also alienated some of his indigenous supporters with this uh, crisis of uh, tipness. Uh, basically, he wanted to build a big road, like highway, through this sort of autonomous indigenous region that was also uh, partially a national park. Mm-hmm. So sort of undermining a lot of this idea okay. of like, I am the indigenous president who looks after Mother Nature and respects mm-hmm. the rights of local indigenous groups. So, you know, who, who is the more authentically or di- indigenous in that Okay. in that situation okay. right that's a kind of like an interesting question i sometimes ask my students okay. so he made a few enemies but you know for various reasons uh and yeah you know sort of this more more recent he was eventually sort of chased out of 
chased out of office uh, yeah. by what a lot of people would call a coup. Uh, yeah, right. And there's a lot of baggage, political and legal baggage, around the word coup. But even putting that aside, an election was held in January, if I remember right. Mm. Or was it... Uh, well, I forget the to, exact date. We have to look up the, the dates here. The exact yeah. timing mm-hmm. here. But uh, a presidential election was held. He again stood for election, which was controversial mm-hmm. in many people's eyes. Right. Uh, the vote was held, and as it was being counted, there was a dramatic shift in the count, whereas the days went on, the numbers moved much more in Morales's direction. And some people interpreted that as an indication that there was fraud or mm-hmm. chicanery going on and that he was manipulating the election to hold on to power. And basically the, the military and some conservative politicians basically showed up with a force of arms and right. said, guess what, you're leaving, right. you're stepping down. Yeah. And he fled the country, mm-hmm. right? I don't know exactly what the details were, but he yeah. left. And They made him an offer he couldn't refuse. I they think. made him an offer he couldn't <laughs> refuse. And observers abroad were very divided. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, you had the OAS, right? Organization of American States. Right. Which I think sort of reflects this inter-American system right. idea. That, right. That what it was its original sort of conception. Mm-hmm. Although I think also increasingly it has moved out of the shadow of sort of U.S., domination okay. uh, although now people are starting to question well was that ever really the case but mm-hmm. certainly that uh, that was the, the the image and I think it certainly did function as a sort of rubber stamp for US policy in a lot of cases particularly in Guatemala okay. um, we certainly know who the most powerful member, member nation is right, <laughs> it is right. the US but it's an organization of western hemisphere states right, right? so US Canada Latin America and they made an initial report saying, we think this must be fraud. We don't mm-hmm. trust this result. And that sort of bolstered the case in many people's eyes that Morales just just had to go, right? Regardless right. of what the exact details were of what happened in the election, he had to go. Well, of course, there were many left-wing critics, right, and observers too, mm-hmm. saying, well, this is just a, another instance of the U.S. orchestrating a coup right to overthrow a Latin American, a democratically legitimate Latin right. American leader. And, you know, so there was a real ideological divide there, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I think that in recent weeks, that OAS report has been largely debunked, mm-hmm. right? That, yeah. that, in fact, it was a perfectly clean election. And if there was a shift in votes, it was more because more of Morales' support was in, like, small rural districts. Right. It took right? longer for those results to come in and, and mm-hmm. be counted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so what do you see? Do you see this fitting into the history of American policy in Latin America? Well, you know, that's, that's definitely an interesting question. You know, I think American policy, I mean, certainly that, that's a continual trope, uh, and Morales very much likes to set himself against the United States. Mm-hmm. You know, I think uh, the jury's still out on how much the U.S. is sort of involved here. Um, you think that, you know, you keep sort of thinking that, oh, this era of just you know sort of manipulation and, and sort of sort of ham-fisted kind of trying to <laughs> trying to meddle in the sort of internal politics of Latin American countries is like, oh, you know, it's been banished. That's that's in the era of the past. But that's a Cold War thing, right? That's a Cold <laughs> War thing or whatever. That's you know, yeah, sort of uh, you know, um, dollar diplomacy and gunboat diplomacy and all these things, you know, Monroe Doctrine. But, you know, there are, you know, these sort of disturbing echoes that keep coming through, um, you know, Hillary Clinton and, uh, you know, Honduras and, um, mm-hmm. you know, Venezuela recently as well. These sort of uh, heightened sanctions and sort of saber-rattling rhetoric mm-hmm. as well as an actual apparently coup attempt. Uh, By a sort of group of American mercenaries. Right. right? Sort of unofficial right. American you know, agents. Right. Yeah. Which you, we didn't, pro- you know, almost certainly did not have U- official U.S. government backing. Uh, although there's also an interesting history of that, too. You know, going back yeah. to like the 19th century. The, the 19th century, yeah. Filibusterers and this guy, William Walker, who sort of set himself, just a private U.S. citizen who set himself up as president of Nicaragua. Right. Took a private uh, army and basically yeah. invaded Nicaragua. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well. sometimes it's it's not all coming from the CIA right, either. Right, right, yeah. It's not all the, you know, the U.S. government. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah, you know, I th- in many ways, I think this is this is largely uh, an internal uh, Bolivian sort of political uh, dynamic. I don't see the U.S. as necessarily a really driving force, although it's an important kind of mm-hmm. rhetorical touchstone for this internal Bolivian political right, struggle. Right. But yeah, you know, it's really it's you know it's 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 getting increasingly ugly, and this you know mm-hmm. supposedly interim government, mm-hmm. which was just sort of taking. Uh, taking hold and promised to hold, you know, new elections almost immediately, uh, still has not hold, held those elections and has found numerous reasons, perhaps legitimate, perhaps not, but has continued to find reasons, um, you know, now with COVID to postpone elections. Mm. Uh, and Sound familiar? Yes, <laughs> right? You know, the other people have suggested that, I have heard. And yeah, you know, uh, there are really these, you know, sort of uh, recent protests that are uh, really ratcheting up the tension. And yeah, you know, you certainly do have an an interim, you know, sort of unelected government that seems to be behaving as if it has this like big mandate to radically change. And President Añez, who is, uh, you know, sort of made a, a lot of sort of song and dance about really, you know, sort of restoring Bolivia. And, you know, she sort of made this big speech with this massive copy of the Bible saying, you know, the Bible is back in power now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so and let's let's explain that for a moment, because, you know, why why would the interim president and if I if I remember right, she was like the president of the Congress. Right. So mm-hmm. she stepped in as interim executive after Morales fled the country. Why would she walk in with a huge Bible. What, what does that have to do uh-huh. with anything? Well, so Evo Morales is, um, you know, sort of uh, made his sort of candidacy and his arrival to power was largely centered around this indigenous, you know, mm-hmm. identity and sort of going back and in many ways trying to overturn this sort of colonial legacy. And uh, so he made this big drive to uh, actually change the flag of Bolivia mm. uh, from this sort of European looking, you know, sort of independence flag from the 19th century to um, this, um, you know, it's this sort of brightly multicolored flag to represent, you know, he also, uh, you know, sort of changed the name of Bolivia to be the plurinational state of Bolivia. To and recognize that, the indigenous nations. Right, yeah. to recognize that Bolivia is actually made up of all of these different indigenous groupings mm-hmm. with their own languages and cultures. And so they should be represented by the flag and mm-hmm. that they should also have a lot more sort of political autonomy to sort of govern themselves in a, in a way that they, you know, in the way that they see fit. Um, so bringing back indigenous symbols, indig- you know, indigenous languages, which have always been spoken, but are, but are now, you know, and the indigenous identity in general, I think did, uh, you know, sort of really receive, you know, there was still a lot of prejudice and, and sort of, yeah, like sort of negative connotations with, uh, with being indigenous. Uh, mm-hmm. And certainly those mm-hmm. ideas are still out there, but, but much less prominently so in a sort of positive embrace of indigeneity and, and symbols of indigenous Bolivians uh, are much more, you know, sort of out in the open and celebrated uh, at the mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. But in many ways, yeah, Añez was sort of trying to take a shot at that, at those okay. developments. And, okay. and by bringing the Bible back, you know, and Morales had sort of, you know, often sort of talked about, uh, you know, the Bible and Christianity as being this, you know, also a colonial, colonial imposition. Right. Yeah. And, and there's this religious element where people in the cities who are more of European descent identify more strongly with Christianity. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the indigenous people, many of them also are Christian, Mm -hmm. but they might also still adhere to uh, indigenous beliefs and practices, indigenous gods and Mm -hmm. spirits. Very much so. And if you're and if you're a really devout or fervent Catholic, you might see that as idolatry, basically. Right. So there's there's this feeling that maybe the interim government is almost like a missionary force, you know, cleansing out paganism Mm -hmm. or idolatry and bringing back correct Christianity. Yeah. I think, you know, if that's the idea, they're going to have an uphill battle. I think, (laughs) you know, this, this sort of notion, uh, you know, that, you know, these, these these two traditions are actually pretty, I think, firmly entrenched Mm -hmm. alongside Mm -hmm. each other. And, and, you know, most Bolivians, at least in my experience, don't really see a big contradiction there yeah. and I think actually the, the Catholic Church in a lot of instances you know despite what we might think about the sort of the Inquisition and all this mm-hmm. you know uh, sort of doctrinal uh, you know sort of hardline stances you know in many ways has been successful because it's sort of incorporated pagan traditions and other kind of you know sort of peasant sort of um, behavior yeah this is a huge ongoing theme in the history well in the history of christianity and also 
particularly the Catholic Church, is mm. how to integrate in right. different practices and traditions. And can you take this uh, African god and say, well, it's really the saint. You know, it's right. really Saint Anthony, right, so that right. makes it okay. Oh, the, the, the days coincide, and, you know, yeah, we can celebrate works, both. But, you, you know, know yeah. they look kind of similar. There's, there's this, and there's always negotiation there, where mm-hmm. you might have the Jesuits saying, oh, it's fine if Chinese people revere their ancestors. That's perfectly right. uh, in accord with Christianity. And then the Franciscans might say, no, that's right. that's idolatry, that's paganism. And, right. and there's push and pull, even within the Catholic Church, over mm-hmm. how to draw those... Bu- boundaries but there's a lot of syncretism right as scholars today would say there's always syncretism there's always combining hybridization so yeah will you know will this Agnes marching in with a bible have any effect on anybody (laughs) but it but it seems to dramatize right a lot of these very old divides in Bolivian society Mm -hmm, right which mm -hmm. which side are you on which kind of Bolivia do you want to see right right yeah, so I think this was a really great conversation. I think this was really cool. And um, people can read your dissertation if they want, right? It's out can there. It's, uh, it's available. Uh, yeah, I think if you Google it, it should, uh, it should just come up. Uh, it's on ProQuest. Um, on ProQuest, great. A bond that will permanently endure. That's right. right. And I'll put it in the description, too. Very kind. Awesome. So thanks for, thanks for talking with us, Oliver Murphy. Oh, thank you, Sam. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. We will hear more soon from historians. Bringing-